encouraged because he clearly was not trying to make something that would be quote unquote successful. I mean, he had he practiced what he preached. And he believed in giving up his control and accepting sense from the world, and that's that's what it was. At the time of the Orenburg show in 1966, he acquired ten telephone lines, which I got from the Bell Telephone Company to install in the armory. On the telephones themselves, we had magnetic pickups on the receiver so that the sounds uh, could be picked up and processed for redistribution in the armory. The telephone uh, went to different parts of the city, like Merce Cunningham Studio, Yes, well, there was, a, it was a quite, not this big, but quite large space, and very high. And, and it had windows on to 3rd Avenue, so of course there was traffic sounds. And there was also in the studio room, it was a very big room, but still off in the corner, which was sort of covered with screens, was a kitchen, <laughs> a sink, and a refrigerator, and a stove, and they worked moderately well. And the sink, there was something wrong with it, I think, I don't remember, it was a long time ago, but it dripped a lot some way, and I think that was one of the sounds that John probably used. The traffic you would get anyway, because the minute you, you uh, put up a microphone there, that's what you heard. And also the room of reverberated in a very interesting way, it was all an old New York building, it must be a high color, and, and very high, so the sound for the line around it. <laughs> One of the telephones ended up in the kitchen of Meat House, which was then a very popular restaurant from 14th Street, where everybody went and got a very good and substantial meal. over a street, an aviary, and we had one at the sanitation department. Another of the open telephone lines ended up in Terry Riley's circle tank. He was a proud owner of turtles which run around in a tank. And this was precisely the sort of thing that John would be fascinated by. Uh, I remember visiting one day at the armory when they were setting up, and I, I specifically came down to show him this piece of mine in C, which then was very new. I had just composed it a few years before, but it hadn't been recorded yet. And I wanted to show it to him, and uh, and he was, you know, we talked about it, and he was kind of tickled to see it, and he was saying, but so great, all the interesting things that young musicians are doing now. And then, uh, I, I mean, pos quite possibly we, we talked about this piece and, and uh, the fact that uh, I did have some things around my house that we might want to use as a sound source. Actually, I got interested in turtles because as Lon Young was raising turtles. And uh, I used to go over and help him bathe and take care of his. And then we decided we wanted to have some too at our place. John wanted to pick up the sounds of the water running to clean the water or circulate the water inside the tank. Yeah, we had the uh, we had the, the turtles uh, set up uh, with, the, with the motor, and then we brought the phone over to the to the right where the motor was, so we could broadcast. In his inimitable curiosity, John uh, wanted the New York Times press it uh, as a sound, that is, when it was running, and it happened to, to be the time, the presses happened to be the time uh, when the performance went on. The one of the, the telephone line ended up at the uh, the time is present. The 
sounds from the radios on the platforms were uh, from broadcast bands that we uh, normally doesn't hear in the United States. Uh, we tried to find the uh, radios that uh, could get the long wave uh, band and the short wave band and uh, the FM band, of course, which was very uh, unused in those days. This was the radio uh, that we used in the 1980s. Uh, I don't know uh, what was interesting about this particular radio is to pick up the transition period when I had transistor on the radio. And it had access to all the bands. 1966, I was learning electronics, and it was directly after that. I was, I was very interested in, uh, in the relationship between uh, sound and, and uh, light. Uh, I worked also with photocells at that time, or a little later. And uh, I was, you know, that, that was the, the first time in history where electronics were inexpensive, small, lightweight, because the transistor was rather new then. David had brought from Stony Point a large horn loudspeaker he called George. One of my tasks on October 15th was to get George operational so that John could have more audio. We installed George on a stand on the armory floor. While fooling around with George, the amplifier and the voltage control generators, I began to make sounds like air raid sirens. John rushed over and exclaimed, Oh, isn't that marvelous? It sounds like war. Let's open with that tonight. chart, schematic diagram of John's piece set forth. There is a rectangle in this flow chart that says David's own. This meant David Tudor's own collection of gadgets, and many of which he connected up with various nonlinear feedback modes so that he could make oscillations sounds that may have sounded out of control, but that is exactly what they wanted. The armory was known for its long echo, which we measured up to six seconds, and which in fact, before we moved in, we knew about, and which somehow horrified us. When David and John discovered it, they realized that they had another dimension to play with. They made use of it, rather than fighting uh, the armor, which would have been a disaster or a possibility. They were in fact like inside a big organ pipe or something where you could hear the resonant frequencies of the sound. And also, to some extent, uh, to one of the, the harsh inches off of any sound, it was a rather pleasant sound, especially the cage piece that we really want to do all the time, doing all these noise like sounds, and it was just filtered by the reverb, and just everything was just so lovely, and everything was not going. Everything was all of the, the gestures were very large and slow just because of the large decay time.
experiments in our technology, which was to uh, use high tech in a way that hadn't been done before. I think that was probably the most interesting side of it in John's piece. Well, Billy Kluger got me into it very early in the game. Uh, I was uh, in the research division trying to make computers talk at, the time, at a time when that was really fun. But earlier in the game, I had been doing work of that by wired electronics, not by programmed computer. But right now, I can't think how I would have done it. <laughs> Passport. Passport or something that came later in the game. But we got over there and suddenly realized we don't have anything like that. Well, it was a way of getting any sound we had on the array of inputs to the speaker we had on the array of outputs. You put your finger on the source and ran over to the column for the destination and pushed the plug in or pushed the plug with a potentiometer.